when I was competing, we didn't talk about injuries, we didn't talk about how we were feeling. It was just like, put on your game face and get out there and compete. In your research, was social media the main villain in this more toxic atmosphere for an athlete's mental health today? Or are there other factors that you believe also contribute to the potential for breakdown in today's, today's athletes? Yeah, I think uh, most of the people I talked to, for sure, like the vast majority of them mentioned uh, social media. Right. But then when I, when I got to the sports psychologist, I say what they talked about was most athletes have a severe sleep. And they say that leads to mental health struggles. But then he went to say that the lack of sleep was because they lay in bed looking at their social media likes yeah. and, and things like that. So, you know, I think a lot of it goes back to social media. With the potential payday in professional sports, more parents are stealing their kids' childhood in the hope they will make it big. How do you think that contributes to a negative factor in a person's mental health? now that this money has been around for at least a generation. Um, yeah, I interviewed a gentleman uh, in the film who's a former uh, AAU coach, right? And he talked about how uh, he was also his son's coach, but how he would push his son really hard to the point where it destroyed their relationship. But he felt like pushing him hard is what would make him you know, a great athlete. And now the kid is like an, uh, one of the top high school athletes in the country. But there is uh, a prevalence of parents pushing their kids uh, too hard. And it does contribute to the child's uh, mental health struggles. What commonality in your research did you find between the public admissions of mental stress from Simone Biles Naomi Osaka and Michael Phillips. No, I think, um, well, I think in Simone Biles and Michael Phelps, I saw a commonality and that commonality was they weren't allowed to be human and they just wanted people to understand they were human beings, but then to get specific, like with Simone Biles, it wasn't said exactly when she uh, pulled out of Tokyo. But, you know, the whole thing, she was going through the thing with Larry Nassar, the sexual uh, harassment stuff. Then we hear, but see, they, they, they brought it up. They talked about something called the twisties. Like literally when you jump in the air and you lose your bearings and, you know, don't feel safe to, to come down, but she had been doing it for years, but now all of a sudden the twisties. So I don't know if that was connected to the sexual assault thing coming up. Naomi Osaka, I had a mental health professional tell me she hasn't come out and said it, but the mental health professional believes that she's autistic. And that's where, and they say that's why she always wears the headphones when she walks out of the uh, tunnel because she has to shield out everything around her. And they believe that's why she has such a problem dealing with press, whereas a lot of other people don't. So I do believe at the end of the day, we as fans, we need to be more supportive of our elite athletes, especially since sports is America's pastime. Right. Well, you know, interestingly enough, and it was just kind of uh, uh, slightly hit upon in your in your documentary, is the atmosphere of, of sports radio. Uh, they're so aggressive on those shows, and to get attention, you have to be aggressive. So, do you feel like that's been a factor into in the fan aspect of it, especially if they're uh, you know big listeners of that sort of thing? So the sports uh, radio thing, we had one guy that we really focused on, Bill Maller, because he's just he's just brutal. You know what that sports radio? So, so okay, so I think it's another connective thing. You know, uh, Dr. Daniel Wan, who's a professor of psychology for Murray State, he talked about how fans' behavior reflects society. And he goes, in society, what has happened is we become less civil. Mm -hmm. 
So because we become less civil, that's played out with people when they go to sporting events. These are less civil people. That sports radio thing is two things. One, I think it destroys athletes. Like when Ben Mel, he's really harsh on Naomi and, and Simone. So I think those sports radio people have to be like that to get an audience. If you think about big audiences, Ben Maller, Howard Stern, yeah. is the shocking, abusive statements that they make about people, which destroys the people that they're making them about, but it gets them an audience. Many of the barbs that are heard at games with athletes of color are often race-based and cause the biggest problems, I think. Why do you think a fan in the stands or sitting behind anonymous social media would lash out in the way they'd never do in everyday life or encounters? Well, like, like Dr. Juan said, the, the uh, being anonymous behind social media like makes people bold. Like you're not going to walk up to LeBron James, who's <laughs> 6'8", 260, and just say that stuff to his face because you know the consequences. So social media has now become this uh, barrier to entry to being tough now. You know, people who could never be tough before could just write that stuff and feel like they don't have to suffer any consequences or yell it out in a, in a, in a, stand, in a sports stadium because they don't have to suffer any uh, consequences. So I think distance at the actual game, like being 30 right. rows up yeah. and social media gives people bully types this uh, platform when now they could be tough. As we experience in the women's gymnastics scandal, the quest to be the best sometimes means looking the other way when either being psychologically or physically abused. In your research, why does that power trip still exist? And how do you think it will change due to that scandal? I believe after that NASSAR thing, because that, that was a big scandal. Yeah that a lot of people, meaning guys, now some will, but I think that there's a percentage of guys that won't attempt that in the public. I mean, in the future, right. that would have attempted it had the whole Nassar thing uh, not happened because that was just a scandal and it was so far reaching. And then you got this stuff with Weinstein and R. Kelly and uh, Bill Cosby. And of course it still goes on, no doubt about it. But I do believe that a lot of guys will think twice before they do that. And I think as long as we keep pushing, holding people accountable, and every time just hold them accountable, we'll start to eradicate this um, systemic abuse that's been going on for, I want to say, for sure decades, but probably yeah. centuries. Finally given the increasingly toxic divisions in our society and how social media is only getting more toxic itself, what are the best recommendations for protecting yourself as an athlete uh, based on your research if you want to keep your sanity? Well, I think there's two. One of them <clears throat> is uh, like Gabby Cunningham in the documentary talked about. She said her parents and coaches, they told her to get off of it. So she just literally removed herself from social media. But then there's a gentleman in the documentary, his name is Craig Ingalls. He's a, a track runner out of Portland, Oregon. What he decided on social media is to be so transparent with his life, so transparent that he said people never heckle him. They never post negative stuff on his social media. They, they're only very supportive of him because he's so transparent, they look at him as a real person and not somebody to kind of throw uh, darts at. So what that led me to believe is by going on there so much, what do you, as an athlete, what are you really trying to accomplish? Like what's your real purpose for all this social media activity? And I think athletes have to really look at that honestly themselves. This is Patrick McDonald for HollywoodChicago.com, copyright 2020.
22.